Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke for Pokemon White 2 with only normal type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first normal type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next gym leader or the final league member's ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. Alright, I'm sure you guys know why we're doing this game. Black 2 and White 2 are among my favorites, yes, but also, doing a normal type run in these games is something I've been geeking over for a little while now. Why, you might ask? Well, there are just so many damn cool and largely underrated encounters that we can get, many of which we've never used before in our hardcore Nuzlocks. Now, it may look like a ridiculous amount of encounter possibilities, but there are a few limitations. First off, Swablu, Slackoth, Wigglytuff, and Lickitung are all only available in the post-game, which cuts those out. The Buneary line also happens to be exclusive to Black 2, not White 2. And finally, since we don't use Legendaries or Mythicals, that will make Meloetta unviable. Aside from that, we're good to go, so let's see what we can manage with this amazing selection of Pokemon in arguably one of the hardest Pokemon games out there. Today's video is sponsored by our friends at Raid Shadow Legends, a free-to-play game for both mobile and PC that I play a lot in my downtime and which gives me another way to engage in highly strategic and dynamic gameplay. You can download it by clicking our exclusive link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen. Now if you watch my content, you're likely a fan of super challenging game elements and Raid most certainly has you covered in this regard. Introducing the Doom Tower. Hour, an extra game mode featuring a giant prison that the Arbiter locked a bunch of enemies in since she wasn't quite powerful enough to vanquish them for good. However, the tower is failing, and it's our job to make our way up floor by floor to see if we can get a handle on this place. Trying to see just how far your army of champions can make it is thrilling, especially given all the different bosses that you can find in here which have specific mechanics needed to beat them. Like the Scarab King. He takes barely any damage unless you can reduce his max HP, and if you attack him without a shield buff on, he'll wreck your entire team pretty fast. Honestly, the real fun is just trying things out and experimenting to see what works against the numerous enemies. Given the types of videos we create on my channel, I'm sure you can see why I like Raid. It's full of all the game elements that I love, such as several different game modes, strategic team building, numerous champion characters to power up, and tons more. If you use my link or scan the QR code, new players will get a free starter pack worth almost $30 to kickstart your game. We're talking a free champion, Tayroll, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, Boost, one energy refill, and one ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in-game. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Big thanks to Raid for sponsoring today's video, and I hope to see you in Teleria. Alright Juniper, what have you got for us? Oh hey, wait a minute. We need one of those. Come here you little shit. Our rival Hugh starts flipping out saying that we need to find some girl named Bianca. Oh wait, here Hugh, I think this is her- Oh god, not this guy again. Hugh, run now! Turns out it's autumn in the game, and if I've ever played it with it being fall, it sure has been a long time ago, as man, this is gorgeous. Bianca offers us a starter Pokemon, and none of them are the normal type, so I decide to just take a Snivy, as this will give Hugh Tepig, who eventually gets the fighting type, arguably our hardest challenge. After pounding Hugh into the ground and showing him that type advantages mean nothing if you're a trash trainer. We head to the Pokemon Center where Bianca gives us some Pokeballs, officially starting our run. Before we head out on our adventure, our mom gives us a gift, some running shoes. Wait, hold on a minute. Mom, I'm 14 years old. Why is this my first ever pair of running shoes? We don't have to wait long at all for our first viable encounter, as on Route 19 we can find a lovely Patra to start us off. We catch it successfully and nickname him Chai, and Chai ends up having a sassy nature, plus special defense and minus speed, which is kind of bad for us. Regardless, it's time to box Chris. Alright Christy, chill, chill, chill. Let's make this an amicable split. It's time to meet the former champion of the region already, and can someone tell me how this man jumps down a 20-foot cliff and lands it? Who is he, f***ing Spider-Man? Man, I cannot get over how damn beautiful it is in the fall here. I mean, just look at him. Oh, never mind, the ground eats you alive! Route 20 already brings about our second encounter, and this one we had to plan for, P-Dove. If we had encountered this in the next area, it would have cut off a different encounter entirely, so good thing we planned ahead. We catch the P-Dove and nickname her Frap, and Frap has a naive nature, plus speed and minus special defense, which isn't bad. Our third encounter can be found on the Flossessi Ranch in this wildly conspicuous grass formation, a lily pup, which we catch and nickname Blondie. Blondie has a mild nature, plus special attack and minus defense, which is pretty damn terrible in every way. Oh well, really excited to use this thing nonetheless. Hugh then challenges us to battle on these people's farm, kinda rude to their crops, dude, and I lead with our newly caught frap as he sends out Tepig. 
What I essentially do here is just outspeed and use Growl to lower his attack twice, then switch into Blondie after realizing that Gus does like nothing on him. That way we have a safe switch and can use Leer to lower his defense before taking him out in two tackles. The benefits of getting more than one encounter before the first gym. Gotta love it. Aw, there's Mareep everywhere. Hello, friend. Bah. Bah. Hmm. Not much of a conversationalist, are we? For some reason, this Plasma Grunt gives us the Frustration TM, the worst mistake of his life, as it's a stab normal move that increases in power the lower the Pokémon's friendship level, and since we all just met, they're not too friendly right now. Up ahead, Alder interrupts us again, and although he seems like a nice dude, I'll show you the truth. Follow me back here. Look. This man has some anger issues, although he does give us some much needed orange berries, so I guess we'll let him live. With that, it's time for the Aspersia City Gym. This gym is full of fellow normal type trainers and... Man, I'm starting to like the Big Pex ability. Never thought it'd be very useful. Frap does great here with both Growl and Leer now, rendering other Pokemon quite ineffective and setting up for Blondie to take them down, although we did have one very close call. Before the gym leader, I make sure to teach all three of our Pokemon the Frustration TM and attach Orin Berries too. The first gym leader is Charon, and his team can be quite scary with Workup, but I'm liking our odds. He leads with a Patrat as I send out Frap. I use Growl right away and then hit him with Frustration, which does huge damage. He then uses Work Up, but thankfully we outspeed, so another hit KOs him. His second and final Pokemon is a Lillipup, and I know he likes to power up his attack with Work Up repeatedly, so I decide to try Growl a couple times, but he keeps using Work Up. I decide to just go for Frustration, and it's looking like a 3 hit KO from here, but his attack is rising, and he slams us to 12 HP with a tackle, but our Orange Berry helps us out. Another Frustration just barely doesn't KO, but I know he'll potion here, so I go for another one to bring him low. Then, we have our secret weapon, Priority Quick Attack, to outspeed and snipe the win. Nice. He also gives us the Workup TM for winning, which should be helpful. Even more helpful than that, though, is Bianca, who gives us what might be the key to this run, the Return TM. Kind of the opposite of Frustration, it goes up to 102 power at max friendship and will be stabbed for all of our Pokémon. Incredible. She also gets my number, and then Charon does as well, and then Bianca gives my number to Juniper... <sighs> I am a wanted man, it seems. We quickly arrive in Verbank City, where there's reality TV drama happening, apparently. Quite a good first impression. After trading a Pokeball for a Great Ball from this guy who has unreal business skills, we can pick up yet another crucial item, the Silk Scarf, to boost normal move power. We can also grab the Thief TM to get type boosting items, along with the Rock Smash TM after beating all of the workers, which should be great for type coverage against types that resist us, like Rock and Steel. Now, amazingly enough, in the Verbank Complex, we can actually get yet another encounter, only in the Shaking Grass spots, Audino. We catch it and nickname her Venti, and Venti has a careful nature, plus special defense and minus special attack. Interesting. Physical Audino for the win, I guess. It's time for the Verbank City Gym. As a poison gym, this one can be kind of tricky, and we had so many close calls with poison, it's not even funny. But miraculously made it through. During the process, we have our first evolution, as Blondie evolves into a Herdier. With that, it's time for the second gym leader, Roxy. Her team can be quite brutal if you're not careful, especially if you get poisoned, as Venishock does massive damage then. She leads with a coughing, and I send out Blondie now, who has Intimidate to lower her attack. Here I go for Work Up to raise our attack, and now I can use Silk Scarf Boosted Return, which does two thirds, then she hardly does any damage to us before we hit her again for the KO. In comes her Ace, Whirlipede, which I immediately hit to a quarter with Return before Venoshock doesn't even bring us below half, and we can smack. Oh, would you stop using Protect? Before we can smash it to death with the power of friendship. Alright, Herdier is a monster. I can't recall having that easy of a time with Roxy, like, ever. Second badge. Oh no. My senses are tingling. Is it time for... Oh no. No, no. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Now somehow we ended up resolving all the family drama by beating Roxy in the field that she's devoted her entire life to, and by replacing her dad in his dream role at Pokestar Studios. How that works, I'm not quite sure, but I won't complain. Stealing his boat, we then arrive in the massive Castelia City. Now one of the weird things here is that you can instantly take the boat to Liberty Garden, but in this game, Victini's not there yet, and I kid you not, there's nothing else to get there. No items, no Pokemon, nothing. While exploring the city, we pick up a whole host of items like the Experience Share, Miracle Seed, Scope Lens, the Rest TM, and we can also find the Massage Girl, whose main role here is to power up our return attacks, basically. 
The Castelia sewers are up next, and I made sure to be careful and use repels, as I don't want Hugh killing our next encounter with his damn pig knight. Amazingly, we can also find the leftovers here, a ridiculous item to get this early in game. During the track, Chai ends up evolving into a Watchog, a Pokemon that I've never really used, so this should be interesting. After dropping Charon down a sewer, we can find our next encounter, Patrat's Gen 1 counterpart, Rattata, which we catch and nickname Afo. Afo has a quiet nature, plus special attack and minus speed. Why? Literally the worst possible nature it could have gotten. Oh well, I'm hyped to use Eradicate in this run. With Team Plasma Oosted, we now have access to Castelia Park, a separate in-game area, which means another encounter, and thankfully it ends up being a Skitty. I did not want an Eevee, as we couldn't have evolved it as per our rules. I named Skitty Shorty, and Shorty has a plus defense and minus attack nature. Now, I've always vouched for wanting to use a Delcaddy, but looking back on his base stats, what the hell, man, this thing sucks. While training up for the next gym, we have a couple evolutions as Frap evolves into a Tranquil, not the prettiest bird out there, and Afo also evolves into Eradicate. Some great power-ups. I also realized that Afo has the Guts ability to charge up his attack when he has a status condition, which could come in handy for sure. It's time for the Castelia gym, a Bug-type gym, and I decide to test out how Afo would fare, even though he's one of our newer Pokémon with lower friendship, and he turns out he actually KOs some Waddles in two hits, which is pretty good. No, I'm serious, those things have higher defense than Snorlax. Relax. The third gym leader is Berg, and I think I have a pretty good plan for this battle, although we'll have to be careful. He leads with a SWAT loon, so I send out Frap. We only have access to special flying moves at the moment, but we get a crit on our four times super effective air cutter for the instant one hit KO. Let's go. He next sends out a Dwebble, a big problem for Frap, so I switch into Blondie, who can get the Intimidate off too. Now, Smackdown does very little, and we have the leftovers to help out. Our best move here is Crunch, which doesn't do much, but we're able to slug it out with him after getting a Leer off for more damage, and end up taking him down. Only being left with 17 HP damage after leftovers, since he took one turn to heal. His final Pokemon is Levani, which can be scary with Razor Leaf, which has a high critical hit ratio, but I switch back into Frap, who resists it, then we get hit by Cut to below half before our berry on the next turn, before slamming it with a 4 times super effective Air Cutter, but he actually survives in the red somehow, and then hits us with a cut down to just 20 HP before we could pull off the win. That would have been very scary had he even gotten one crit on us, but we pulled through and got the badge. Now up ahead on Route 4, we have a big problem. Colrus, who specializes in steel types which wall the absolute hell out of us, and the dig TM is only accessible just past him. But we have one saving grace, the Rock Smash TM. Let's see if this can be pulled off. He leaves with a Magnemite, and I send out Chai, who I taught it to. Rock Smash does do over half, but then he lands a Thunder Wave, and we can't get Cherry Berries yet. I put the leftovers on to negate Sandstorm damage, though, and we make it through Paralysis after one hit to take him down. In comes a big threat, though, Clink. He goes for Gear Grind immediately, and takes us down to just 26 HP, but we do land a Rock Smash, but it only does a third, but we did get the Defense Drop. We get out spent here due to Paralysis, so I switch into Blondie for Intimidate, and thankfully he just went for Charge, as he does have Thundershock too. Our best bet is Return, which brings him to just a sliver, but he uses Charge again for some reason, then Super Potions, but two more hits in a row do the job despite the resistance. A bit scary, but we managed. I keep forgetting that Route 4 is way different in design than in Black 2, but we can get a few great items here, such as Citrus Berries. It also occurred to me that you can find a fully evolved Braviary of all things here as an overworld encounter, but that only happens on Mondays, so I guess it wasn't meant to be. We can finally pick up the Dig TM though, along with its perfect pairing item, the soft sand. After that, we arrive in Nimbasa City, the location of the fourth gym. In one of the houses here, we can grab the Soothe Bell to increase friendship, so Return is growing ever stronger. Oh boy. Yeah, I need to get rid of Venti as soon as possible. I am deeply disturbed. The Nimbasa Gym is upon us, and I hooked Afo up with the Dig and Soft Sand combo, which I thought would ravage all the trainers, but it turns out he's outsped by even Elekid due to his minus speed nature. We need speed EVs real bad. This resulted in some very close calls due to paralysis, but we made it through unharmed. Now, I had thought about going back to get the Eviolite here, which I seem to have forgotten, but honestly, all of our Pokémon are going to be fully evolved shortly, so I rolled with what we have. The fourth gym leader is Elisa, the Electric Trainer. She is one of the most terrifying gym leaders for most teams, and I don't think this is really an exception, but I theorycrafted and came up with the best strat I could. 
She leads with an Amolga, and I send out Afo. She outspeeds and goes for Volt Switch immediately, and I had used Return, which does over half on Flaffy. Now, I know that this thing can't Volt Switch, so I outspeed and go for Dig for the KO. Back in comes Emolga, who Volt Switches yet again, this time into Zeb Strika, and Return does over half, but her Citrus Berry helps her out. With Afo now low, I have to switch, so I send in Blondie as she Volt Switches yet again. Another Volt Switch hits us low, and Return just barely doesn't KO Zeb Strika on a sliver. Ugh. I know she'll likely heal here, so I switch into Chai as we get hit again. And here's the mistake I made. I forgot she only had Spark in the original Black and White, not the sequels, so she Volt Switched again as I went for Dig. Oops. At least we got Leftover's recovery, I guess. Now, if she somehow stays in, I don't want to go for Dig again, so I'm forced to return as she does Volt Switch into Zeb Strika, and it survives on a quarter, and here I said the hell with it and just went for return again, and she just used Pursuit here, so we got the KO. Whew. With all of our other viable Pokemon at low health, I switch into our last hope, Venti, who absolutely tanks Volt Switch. From here, we're able to slug it out with Emolga using Secret Power, and on the last turn we got Paralysis from it, ha, huh, serves her right, as we can then outspeed and KO with under half remaining. Wow. She did a number on our team, and the battle was quite messy, but thankfully we didn't get punished. It always looks like her and her gang are chasing after you to beat the shit out of you on this runway, doesn't it? <laughs> Forget the musical, Afo out here looking like he's about to ask your mama on a date. Route 16 east of Nimbasa brings us another encounter, a Mincino, which we catch and nickname Grande. Now, Skitty is very lucky that we likely won't get a shiny stone for a while, so I leave Grande in the box for now. On Route 5, Bianca comes through for us yet again, this time with the Fly HM, not only making things more convenient for us, but also finally giving Frap a physical flying move. Oh boy. Never before have we had such a basic cookie-cutter crew of Pokémon. But on the other hand, never before have we had such legendary Pokémon either. After Hugh comes from a mile away to punch a Plasma Grunt in the face, we arrive in Dripvale City, which has received a bit of an upgrade since the desert hellhole it was a couple years ago. Here we can grab the Expert Belt, an amazing item to further the power of super effective moves, and we can also get the Big Root item from this guy in the hotel. Now, initially, I thought this was amazing because I was going to go ahead to Route 6 to try and catch a Deerling for the next gym, but apparently it evolves literally the level after the level cap, so that likely won't be much help. However, I found an alternate plan. The Move Tutor here teaches the Grass-type Seed Bomb, and it turns out that Chai can actually learn it. Let's go! While grinding for the gym, we get a couple of team upgrades as Blondie finally evolves into a Beastly Stoutland, and Frap also ends up evolving into an Unpheasant, and thankfully not the weird-looking one. The Drift Fail Gym is upon us, and Chai was an absolute monster through all of the trainers with Seed Bomb and the Expert Belt attached, which is quite an interesting combination for a normal type. The fifth gym leader is Clay, the ground type specialist, and although his team is always scary, I'm thinking if we play it well, the odds might be in our favor. He does lead with a Croc Rock with Intimidate though, so I lead with Blondie who can intimidate him right back. Does that even make sense? I then switch into Chai as he goes for Bulldoze, which doesn't do much after the attack drop, but does lower our speed. That allows him to hit a crunch to half afterwards, and he gets the defense drop. Oh, that is not good. From there, we can one-hit KO him with C-Bomb, though. In comes Sand Slash next, and with our lowered speed and lowered defense, I have to switch. I go into Frap, and he missed his Fury Cutter of all things, and then I hit him with Return for less than half before Crush Claw does a quarter. I then go for Fly here, and it leaves him on just a sliver, so he hits us to half before then healing, after which we got a higher roll on Return, so two of them take him out. His final Pokemon is a scary one, Excadrill. I switch into Blondie immediately for the Intimidate as we get hit by Rock Slide. I then go for Soft Sand Boosted Dig, which hits him to below half after his berry, and then Bulldoze brings us to half and lowers our speed so he can attack us again on the next turn to 36 HP, and thankfully we don't flinch so another Dig finishes him off. A pretty fun battle, I must say. Uh, hey, Volcarona, buddy, How, how's it going? Alright, who had Game Freak decided that this wasn't a legendary? I mean, it's got its own overworld encounter and its own room. Down here in the Relic Passage, we can also find the Rocky Helmet item, and hey, wait a minute. Yeah, just as I thought, this guy at the Pokemon World Tournament also gives you one. Weird. After Blondie does an amazing job tearing through the tournament, I went searching for our next encounter on Route 6. Now, we have a bit of a messy situation where some of our encounters appear at the same place as each other, but here I was hunting for a Dunsparce in the Shaking Grass spots, which only occurs as a 10% chance within them, and we ended up getting a damn cast form of all things, which is a 5% chance in Shaking Grass spots. How in the world? I nickname him Don't Want You immediately. No one tell Antler Boy we lost a Dunsparce, okay? 
Thankfully up ahead we get some good news as we can find a Moonstone, meaning we can finally evolve Shorty into a Delcaddy, one of the most OP Pokémon of all time. Interested to see how this thing will fare. Oh god. Alright, that thing is our worst nightmare. A legendary steel and fighting type. Good thing it doesn't actually fight you or that would have ended the run most likely. Also, did anyone else forget that there is something called the free space in your bag in these games where you can just shove a bunch of items that you don't want at the moment? What an amazing game. After picking up the magnet in Charnstone Cave, we arrive in Mistralton City where the next gym is. Right away in the airport, we can pick up the Sharp Beak, which is amazing for Frap. While preparing for the gym, I realize something incredible. If we go back to the World Tournament, we can find the Move Reminder, who can actually teach Stoutland all three Fang moves. So, I have him teach Thunder Fang, which should be very helpful. By the way, Delcaddy can't do sh like literally no moves it can learn, and we don't get Thunderbolt until way later in the game. It's time for the Mistralton Gym, a flying type gym, and Blondie powers through the trainers with the Expert Belt. There was no hope for them. The sixth gym leader is Skyla, and she's one that we have to be careful about, especially with her Skarmory. She leads with a Swoobat, and I actually lead with Shorty here, hoping to take it down with Faint Attack. She uses Heart Stamp off the bat, and gets the flinch immediately. Alrighty then. Acrobatics then brings us to a third before our berry, and then I use Charm to lower her attack. Another Acrobatics then doesn't do much as Faint Attack does a third to her. Another round of that brings her to the red, but then she heals. Another Acrobatics hits us, and we survive on just 4 HP before barely not taking her out again. Ah, oh, couldn't have even taken out a Swoobat, huh, Shorty? Here, I switch an Afo to tank an attack and take it down with Priority Quick Attack. In comes Swana next, so I decide to stay in, but she hits us with Air Slash low and flinches us. Oh. Here I switch in Blondie, who tanks two Air Slashes to below half before slamming her with four times super effective Thunder Fang for the KO. Her final Pokemon is Skarmory, and I know what I have to do here. I switch in Venti, and I use Growl twice to drop its attack, and then use Secret Power, and my plan works as we paralyze it. From here, I'm feeling safe to send out Blondie again for another Intimidate, and after a workup, Thunderfang does the job with a crit after we had missed twice in a row, bringing us down to 33 HP. We crippled that thing pretty well, but still some close moments for sure. North of Mistralton on Route 7, we can get our Deerling, which I catch and nickname Caramel. Gonna leave him in the PC for now, but we'll definitely be using him later. Up ahead in Lentimus Town, we have an answer to one of our big problems. The Move Tutor, who can teach Delcaddy Hyper Voice a great special normal move, but also I notice it can learn Icy Wind, which I think might come in handy. Here we can also grab the Spell Tag and the Shadow Ball TM she can learn too. A long trek through Reversal Mountain brings us to Undela Town, such a beautiful place, where Hugh ends up challenging us to battle. He leaves with Unpheasant, and I send out our newly upgraded Shorty. He went for Razor Wind, a two-turn attack, perfect for my strategy as I hit him with Icy Wind to lower his speed, and then we outspeed his second turn for the KO. Now we're talking. In comes Embor though, a huge threat for us, so I switch into Frap who gets hit by takedown to almost half before we can smash him with Fly for the one-hit KO. What power. His final Pokemon is Simipore, and I was worried about this one as it could sweep through our entire team, but thankfully we have Venti who can tank his attacks reasonably well with the help of Leftovers. A third attack brings us to the red though, and we brought him below half, and our secret power didn't get a status, but did drop his accuracy. Here I send Shorty back out, and he missed his first attack, but then hit a Scald and burned, but Hyper Voice amazingly gets the KO from there. That could have been dangerous, but Shorty and Venti saved the day. Who would have thought? Ugh, alright, I already hate Delcaddy again. Why? Just why? Put me out of my misery. The village bridge is where our next encounter is, well, more specifically near the water under the bridge, as here we can find a Zangoose. We catch it successfully and I name him Sumatra and leave him in the PC for the time being. Opelucid City is next, where the next gym is, and after some grinding, it's time to tackle it. Shorty handles the trainers really well with our Icy Wind strategy, and in no time it's time for the Dragon-type gym leader, Drayden. He leads with a Dredagon as I send out Shorty. Icy Wind does a third, Slash then hits us for a quarter, but our cute charm ability activates. Amazing. Another Icy Wind brings him to the red, and then he's immobilized, so I use a few more attacks as he got immobilized once again to take him down. Solid. Flygon comes out next and gets outsped with Icy Wind, but somehow survives on just a sliver and then hits us with Dragon Tail into Chai, but thankfully we outspeed and take him down. 
His final Pokemon is Haxorus, and here I switch in Blondie for Intimidate, and then he made the mistake of Dragon Dancing way too much, so two returns finished him off for our seventh badge. Opelucid City then gets attacked out of nowhere by a flying pirate ship that shoots ice. And here we have what is normally a very tough battle with Zinzolin. However, I had switched Thunderfang out for Firefang on Blondie, and with the Expert Belt, this results in instant one-hit KOs on his two Cryogonals, even though the first one got a critical hit Ice Beam on us on the very first turn. In comes his Weavile next, so here I switched into Shorty, who tanked Night Slash, and got the Q Charm activation as planned. He did hit us again though to the red before we got an icy wind off to lower his speed. That way I could switch Chai in, who tanked two attacks in a row as he got hurt by the rocky helmet and then return, but survived in the red. From there though, I can switch an Afo to tank an attack and then take it down with priority quick attack. After that, the Shadow Triad dude was a pretty easy takedown with Blondie's Fire Fang on the Ponyards and a hyper-powered return on his Absol, after which we reached the level cap. Looking forward, I realize we're going to need one of our stored team members, Caramel, who ends up having a sassy plus special defense and minus speed nature, not ideal. While grinding, he quickly evolves into a Sazbuck, who I think is going to be a savior shortly. Now, funnily enough, I had actually heard very recently that Mantine isn't the only giant Pokemon you can see in the Marine Hoop. It's super rare, but you could also see Wailord here, and it happened. Literally the first time I go through here after hearing about it, and it magically appeared. This is so damn cool. At the end of the tube, this lady gives us the Facade TM, which doubles in power if the user has a status, so this could be something for sure, as it is a stab move too. It's time for the 8th and final gym in Humalau City, and here we have a new secret weapon, Caramel, who with Horn Leech and the Expert Belt not only tears through the trainers, but also gym leader Marlin himself, the Water Trainer. His Caracosta does have Sturdy, but since he just healed afterward, we could outspeed and basically one hit KO every single one of his Pokemon with Stab Super Effective, Expert Belt Boosted, Horn Leech. Incredible. All 8 badges acquired. Hello, it is Sylph here, the future champion of the Unova region. But where's my wife? Hey, yo, what's up, dude? Please don't attack me, I'm just coming to say hi. Aboard the Plasma Frigate, we worked together with Hugh to take down Zinzalin in a double battle, and it went pretty well since Embor is a kind of overpowered team member to have in this battle, to be honest. In the Giant Chasm area, we can pick up the Ice Beam TM before it's time to tackle the final battles of Team Plasma. Hugh ends up going absolutely ballistic and screams, Hey! Is this South Beach? That, like, this- Who the f you up? Who that f again? Who that f again? The South Beach? Yell in my fing ear again. Now here, we can not only pick up another Moonstone, how convenient, but just two steps away we can grab yet another encounter, a Clefairy, who I catch and nickname Pumpkin. Checking it in the PC, it turns out to have a modest nature. Oh man, ideal in every way. I decide to take the Clefairy over Audino as, well, it's a better Pokemon if I'm honest, and we're gonna need all the help that we can get. Thanks for your services, Venti. You were alright. Using the Moonstone on Clefairy nets us a bulky Clefable, who we can also teach some good TMs to too, since it gets wicked coverage. At the end of the frigate stands a trainer that I am terrified of, Colrus, the Steel Trainer, who resists the type we're working with. Not only does he have things like Eviolite Magneton, but a few of his Pokemon also have Sturdy too, which makes this complicated. He leaves with that Eviolite Magneton though, so I send out Caramel, who has Jump Kick, which does over half, but he hits us with Thunder Wave. We've broken Sturdy though, so we can tank a Flash Cannon to half and then make it through Paralysis for the KO. However, in comes Magnezone next, a rough switch in for us that I wasn't expecting. Here I send out Blondie for Intimidate since he does have Explosion, and Discharge hits us for nearly half. Sheesh. Here I go for Dig, which brings him down to Sturdy before he hits us with Thunder Wave. I knew he would heal, so I went for Return just to break his Sturdy, but we stay paralyzed. Discharge then brings us low before we get a Return off. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Chai. Flash Cannon does over half, but we can outspeed and take him down with Dig now that Sturdy's broken. In comes Kling Clang next, and we're running out of options for us to switch in, but I send out Afo, and he went for Giga Impact, but we survive on just 19 HP. Phew. Since he has to recharge now, I hit him with return to just break his air balloon, but with such high defense, I don't think Dig will KO here, and we might get outsped anyway, so... I decide to play it safe and switch into Pumpkin, but he gets a crit on his gear grind. Oh no, that might be everything in this battle. I have to switch yet again, but I have no options. It's looking like I have to sack someone, so I choose Chai, who gets KO'd by Giga Impact. 
The Rocky Helmet helped though, so on his recharge turn I can use Moonlight to heal, and then he uses Shift Gear as I get a Cosmic Power off to raise our defenses. It is a long grind here, a gear grind if you will, but I chip him down with Shadow Ball and healed up whenever he uses Giga Impact, and eventually we take him down with Pumpkin with half health remaining. In comes Metang next, and with the defense boost we're able to take him down with a few Shadow Balls with just 40 HP left after he got an attack raise from Meteor Mash. His final Pokemon is BHM, and with no more Moonlights left, low health, and only 4 Shadow Shadow Balls, we were not very well set up as he started using Calm Mind 2 followed by Recover. I saw that we were getting overpowered here, so I decided to take the risk to switch out before he became too powerful, and thankfully we switched in Frap as he was using Energy Ball since Clefable was low health, which I baited, so a return finished him off. That was one of the toughest battles I think we've ever had, and Chai was an unfortunate loss, but it could have been a lot worse. Now, while picking a replacement for Chai, I realized Minchino only has the cute charm ability, not technician, but Zangoose has immunity. Oh my god. The realization settles in that we could have something special on our hands. I take Sumatra with us and teach him the Shadow Claw TM, and you'll see where this is all going very shortly. But first, a brief interruption for legendary Pokemon going absolutely ballistic and fusing their DNA with each other. Alright, that sounds kind of bad. It's time for the final plasma battle, Getsis. Now normally the big problem with this battle is that you can't set up against him at all because his Kofagrigus has Toxic which wears you down way too fast. However, with immunity, Sumatra can't get poisoned, so here we can set up a few swords dances, only getting hit by Psychic. Then, since we have Shadow Claw, we can KO Kafagrigus and then proceed to sweep his entire team with return. Unbelievable. Sumatra is a legend. With that, it's time for the long track through Victory Road. Along the way, I realize we have one last encounter opportunity, a rufflet, which I catch and nickname Merica. Now, I was thinking in my head all along, I wanted to replace Frap with a Braviary, and I was like, well, maybe if it has something like a jolly nature, my viewers might understand. And I kid you not, I checked the PC, and it's literally jolly. So, uh, yeah, sorry guys, Frap's being replaced. We quickly evolve Mirica into a beastly Braviary, which I am so excited to use. Before the League, I do a ton of preparation, including using the Move Relearner to teach Braviary Hone Claws and Afo Swords Dance, and also fulfill the rest of our EVs. Our last challenge before the League is Hugh, but I came up with a great strat for him. He leads with an Unpheasant, ironically enough, so I send out his replacement, Merica. I know he's undoubtedly going to go for Swagger, so I attached a Person Berry on Merica, went for Hone Claws to raise our attack, and he did, so now we get the attack raise from Swagger for free, and proceed to sweep through his entire team with Return. See why I wanted this thing? It's time. We've arrived at the Unova Region Pokemon League. Let's see if we can finish the fight. The first Elite Four member is Chantal, the Ghost-type trainer. Now what's interesting is we kind of have a Getsis situation here, except Trakafagrigus has Will-O-Wisp, so I can't use Sumatra again. However, we have another secret weapon, Afo. I pre-poisoned him to activate his Guts ability, as there's no guarantee she'd use Will-O-Wisp, which means now we could use Sword Stance, and with the Expert Belt attached and Guts activated, tank a Psychic and then sweep through her first three Pokémon with Crunch, even though we got the Mummy ability from Kafagrigus, we still have enough power. It was a very close calculation though, as we ended up with 13 HP from Poison as Drip Blim came out, but a switch into Sumatra for two Shadow Claws did the job, thanks to our Berry, which brought us above half again and allowed us to survive aftermath damage on just 15 HP. The next Elite Four member is Grimsley, the Dark-type trainer, and his team's a little bit complicated with his Crocodile having Intimidate. He leads with a Lipard, so I send out Blondie for the Intimidate, who, after getting hit by two attacks, KOs it instantly with Return. Now, I knew this would bait the Scrafty out, so I switch in Merica, but I thought he'd go for a fighting move, but instead he used Rock Tomb. How in the world did he predict that? Regardless, one fly does the job from there. In comes Intimidate Crocodile, so I switch in Caramel to tank a Crunch to just above half, and it's close, but I have no choice, so I stay in, he outspeeds, and hits us to just 5 HP before we can then instantly KO him with Corn Leech. Whew. I wanted to keep him out there for just this reason, as Bisharp comes out and we can use 4 times super effective Jump Kick for the one hit KO. The third Elite Four member is Caitlyn, the Psychic type trainer. Her team is quite bulky, but I do think we have a way to beat her. She leads with a Musharna, which does have Yawn, so I send out Afo since again, he's poisoned already, so she can't really do much to us. This allows me to get a Swords Dance off, but she used Reflect. I go for one more though, since we'll have plus four attack and the Guts ability boost, so I think we should still be able to do this, and Afo pulls it off, KOing all four of her Pokemon with a super-powered Crunch, with us being left at 22 HP. 
Don't sleep on Raticate, man. Don't do it. The last Elite Four member is the one that I'm most scared of, Marshall. I spent a lot of time theorycrafting for this one, and as easy as it might look with something like Braviary, there are a few complications, like the fact that they all have rock moves, Sock has Sturdy, and Fly is a two-turn move, so Conkeldur could bulk up while we're up in the air and mess everything up. Regardless, I do leave with Marika, who can one-hit KO throw at least. My fears come true though, as he sends out Conkeldur next. I know we can survive an unboosted Stone Edge, so I hit him with Return first. His Citrus Berry activates, and then he hits a Stone Edge for massive damage. With a little damage on him now, I think we could KO even if he did bulk up, but he just used Hammer Arm anyway, so Fly KOs. In comes Sock next, and because of Sturdy, I have to switch, so I go into Plondi for the Intimidate, but Brick Break still does huge damage. Our Citrus Berry helps though, but I know we need to Intimidate again if we're to pull this off, so I switch into Caramel, and it turns out he just used Payback. Weird. Here, I decide to go for Horn Leech, since that'll bring us back up to full and break Sturdy, and we do indeed survive a Brick Break from there with just 33 HP. Here, I switch back into Blondie for the double Intimidate, but he got a crit, ruining our entire plan. Oh, that was a brutal loss. From there though, we can send Merica back in and KO Sock, and then amazingly we even outspeed Mian Xiao as I planned and take it down with a fly. A very rough loss with Blondie, but we pulled through the hardest Elite Four member at least. It's time, the final battle, the champion Iris, whose team is quite scary and diverse. After some theory crafting, I come up with our best plan and take her on. She leaves with her beastly Hydreigon, and I send out Sumatra. Now, as far as I can tell, we should be able to survive anything that she uses here, and we do, as Dragon Pulse brings us to 60 HP, after which we can get a Swords Dance off. Here, we can then outspeed and slam her with a close combat for the KO. Nice. In comes Dredagon next, and after Swords Dance, Return is a one-hit KO on it. She then sends out Agron, and four times super effective close combat obliterates it. Holy, Sumatra is on a tear. However, she sends out Haxorus next, which I know has Focus Sash attached, but there's nothing much I can do here, so I hit her down to it before she KOs Sumatra. Here I send in Afo, as I know she's going to heal, so I hit a 140 power Guest Boosted Facade before another attack on the following turn takes her out. Her next Pokemon is Lapras, and there's no use risking a switch here, so I hit it with Facade, but it barely survives in the red and hits it with Surf, but Afo tanks it and can take it out on the next turn, being left with 20 25 HP. However, in comes Archeops, which outspeeds and destroys Afo immediately. This is it. I switch in Merica here to determine the King of the Skies as we have Rock Tomb and outspeed, but we missed and Rock Slide brings us to just 31 HP. Damn. Rock Tomb then hits it to the red, but we get KO'd by another attack. I send in Pumpkin here, get smashed by Endeavor down to just 32 HP, but a final Ice Beam does her in with just two Pokemon remaining. Wow, we did it. We beat a Pokemon White 2 Hardcore Nuzlocke with only normal types, and what a wicked variety of underrated Pokemon we got to use. A lot of them impressed me even more than I thought, and I'm really happy we tried this one out. I hope you had fun with the run, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really helps and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out, and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next, and I'll see you guys for our our next challenge video.